Jesus? That's the question we're actually going to be considering over the next several weeks during the course of this summer. Every summer I like to try and have a sermon series based on the Gospels, to try and look in particular at Jesus, at what He said and what He did, so that we can experience Jesus in a new way in our lives. And so that's what I want to try and do this summer. But I want to start off by asking you, who is Jesus to you? Personally, how would you answer that question? What words would you use? What phrases would you use to describe who you understand Jesus to be? If you ask that question to your family or friends, co-workers, neighbors, what kinds of answers would you get to the question, who is Jesus? A production crew uh, went um, across the New York City streets to ask that very question, and I want you to listen to some of the answers that were given. I'd like you to listen to them from the standpoint of, do you agree or disagree with the sentiments expressed? Do any of these express what you believe about Jesus? Do you have questions about any of them? I hope to use this as a, as a stimulation to us having a discussion today about who is Jesus. Listen as the answers on the New York City streets were given. Historical figure? I don't know. <laughs> I think he was just a person. I don't know. Just a normal person like us. He was a selfless person. I have no clue. He was a man. I think he was marketing genius because he got people to believe him. I don't I don't think he's the son of God. I don't, don't believe that at all. If David Copperfield was in the day of Jesus, he would be Jesus. I'm pretty sure he existed. Like, I'm not going to say that he didn't exist. He was God's son, but so was Gandhi, and so was Muhammad, and so was, you know, we're all God's children. Jesus is someone I pray to. Well, Jesus is my Lord and Savior, um, and he, to me, is the, like, symbol of just ultimate forgiveness and ultimate love. He's sort of that, like, constant figure in my life. Jesus is also Isa in Arabic, and he was a messenger as well. He was just extremely enlightened, like, religiously and morally. Was somebody that um, just tried to um, impart wisdom on others and um, make the world a better place. I think he saw something that a lot of people didn't see and still don't see in others. And I, I think that's just a lot of love and, and hope. Jesus sort of seemed like an ominous uh, figure. You know, he just, he, he was God and it was hard to relate to him. But I think as I've grown in my faith a lot, I've really started to see Jesus as my closest friend. So were there any statements that you identified with? Were there any that you said, oh, that's definitely not what I believe? And maybe there were some where you said, yeah, that's kind of close to what I believe. I want to think with you about that today as we um, embark on a new summer sermon series called A Great and Good Savior, I Am Sayings of Jesus. During the course of this summer, we're going to look at the sayings of Jesus, the statements of Jesus, where he said, I am some of those statements that we'll look at over the course of the summer are things like, I am the bread of life, John chapter 6. I am the light of the world, John chapter 8. I am the door and I am the good shepherd, John chapter 10. I am the resurrection and the life, John chapter 11. I am the way, the truth, and the life, John chapter 14. And I am the true vine. John chapter 15. Over the course of the summer, we're going to try and understand what each of these statements made by Jesus, what he meant by them, but also what they mean for us today. We're going to understand how if Jesus is the light, how his light can help and bring light into our lives as well. But before we actually begin to look at each of those statements, I actually want to step back this week and look at a statement that Jesus made. It's not often called one of the seven I am sayings because he doesn't actually use a metaphor in this. He just strictly states it. He states in John chapter 8, before Abraham was, I am. That's what he said. Before 
Abraham was, I am. And so I want to think with you today about what is Jesus really saying before Abraham? 2,000 years before Jesus walked the earth? Before Abraham? I am? What does Jesus mean by that statement? How did the people of Jesus' day understand that statement? What does it mean for us today? I hope to be able to communicate this big idea to you today that Jesus made an astonishing claim about himself. I don't want to, I don't, I, I want to make it as big as Jesus made it. He made it an astonishing claim about himself. And we must believe it and experience it or reject it. It's that simple. Jesus made a claim about himself that puts him in a league above everyone else. And we either have to accept it and experience it to its fullness, or we have to know why we reject it. And I don't know, maybe you're in a different, you know, different people are in different spheres of understanding about Jesus. I want to open up a dialogue to you today. If you're not sure who Jesus is, I don't want you to say, oh, well, he believes Jesus is this, and so I won't listen to him. Please, let's have a dialogue as we think about who Jesus is. So that statement that Jesus made before Abraham was, I am, in John chapter 8, verse 58, actually has a context, and I want to just help you understand the context. Jesus often, when he preached and when he spoke, stirred controversy. Not because he wanted to stir controversy, but because his words were so important and so revolutionary that it, it caused people to say either I agree with him or I don't. And he often stirred a controversy as he spoke. So the claim that Jesus made in John 8, 58, before Abraham was, I am, has a context. And the context is that one of the sayings that we'll look at in a week or two, and that is, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. That's one of the seven I am statements. He says, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And this statement that Jesus made in John chapter 8, verse 12, then leads to a controversy that we see all the way from verse 13, all the way to verse 57 in John's gospel, that then leads to Jesus doubling down, if you will, and saying, before Abraham was, I am. So what was Jesus saying and how did, his, how did his disciples understand it? But also, how did the Jewish leaders of his day understand it? After Jesus made this statement, the Pharisees posed a series of questions to him and statements to him. And it revolves around their understanding that they were Abraham's children, descendants. And therefore, that gave them a special status and place in God's heart and in God's promises. And so several times you see the Pharisees and the religious leaders of the day say to Jesus things like, we're Abraham's descendants. We belong to Abraham. So in verse 33, they answer Jesus, we are Abraham's descendants. In verse 39, they say, Abraham is our father. And then in verse 52, they say, um, uh, Abraham died, and so did the prophets. Yet you say that whoever obeys your word will never taste death. They understood that Jesus was actually saying he was greater than Abraham, and they didn't like that. Because Abraham is, was the father of the Jewish people. You don't mess around with someone that important unless you are more important. And they were... They were not happy that Jesus was, was, was saying things that made it imply that he was greater than Abraham. And they were challenging him. Do you mean you're greater than Abraham? So they finally say in verse 53, are you greater than our father Abraham? He died and so did the prophets. And then they say, who do you think you are? You ever, you ever say that to somebody? Or have you ever had somebody say that to you? Um, I won't tell you, uh, but I've had somebody say to me, who do you think you are? Um, but, but this is like, you, you have gotten to the end. Who do you think you are? They ask him in John chapter 8 and verse 53. And then Jesus says, I'll tell you who I am. He doesn't hide it. He doesn't hide it. And in fact, Jesus then makes an astonishing claim, an astonishing claim about his preexistence and his divinity. 
I want you to see what Jesus says about himself. Here's what he says in verse 56. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. It, what is he saying? Yeah, I'm greater than Abraham. You heard it from my lips. I'm greater. Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. And then they asked him, you're not yet 50 years old. Jesus was in his 30s. They're just rounding it up. They're saying, you're not yet 50 years old. And they said to him, and you've seen Abraham? Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? And it's against that backdrop that Jesus makes this astounding statement. Very truly, or in the King James, verily, verily, truthfully, truthfully. Now, Jesus never spoke any falsehood, but when he wanted to emphasize the importance of what he was saying, he would say, truly, truly, or very truly, I tell you. And then, then Jesus makes this whopper of a statement. Before Abraham was born, I am. Now, you might say, so what's the big deal? I hope to try and communicate the big deal to you. First, Jesus is making a clear statement about his pre-existence. He's saying, I existed before Abraham. Before Abraham was born, he goes all the way back. He says, go back further than that, further than that, further than that. My existence predates Abraham before Abraham was born, he says. Jesus is making a claim, an astonishing claim of his pre-existence. The Bible speaks about that in places like John chapter 1. In the beginning was the word, w, w, capital W-O-R-D, the word, speaking of the Greek word logos, which is this word of the, the reason and the, the rhyme of the universe. Jesus is claiming to be, in the beginning he was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The Bible makes astounding claims about Jesus. Jesus says in John chapter 17, verse 5, that he existed with the Father in glory before the beginning of the creation of the world. Jesus makes these kinds of claims about his pre-existence. The one who was standing there in front of them in the flesh didn't become at the moment of his birth. He, he took on flesh, yes, it was a real human birth, but his existence, his identity, who he was pre, predated all of that. In fact, it goes back even further than Abraham, further than the beginning of the world. That's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, I existed from the very beginning. Before there was a beginning, I existed. That's who Jesus is saying that he is. But then he goes on to say also, before Abraham was born... I am. He didn't say I was. Like, I, 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 I was a little bit before Abraham. I beat him by a couple hours, a couple days, a couple centuries. No. He's saying before Abraham was born, I am. He's making an astonishing claim about his divinity. Now, you might say, wow, this is really strong stuff. And, you know, we're told not to boast, right? We're told, you know, boasting about ourselves is not good. But, you know, what Muhammad Ali said is true. It's not bragging if you can back it up. And what Jesus is going to do is back it all up. He's just claiming the truth. He's just making a statement of fact about the universe. Jesus can back up everything he claimed about himself. In fact, when he claimed in John chapter 11, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even if they die, yet they shall live. What did Jesus do to back up that claim? He went over to the tomb of his dear departed friend Lazarus who had died and was in the tomb. And he said, I'll show you. I can back this up. Lazarus, come forth. I'm the resurrection and the life. I have the power of life and death in my hands, in my voice. And he raised his, his dear friend Lazarus, who is dead. Jesus can back up any claim that he makes about himself. But he makes this astounding claim. Before Abraham was, I am. 
What does he mean when he says, I am? Well, to the Jew of his day, and to those of us who are familiar with the teaching of the Old Testament, it harkens back to something that we saw several weeks back as we were studying the life of Moses. Do you remember when Moses fled to the wilderness of Midian and he was wallowing, you know, for years in solitude there? And one day he comes across this bush that's burning. It's just burning. It's not consumed. It just kept burning. And it was like, what is this bush? I've never seen this before. But out of the bush then... He hears a voice. What did that voice say? Moses, Moses, you know, I've heard the cries of my people and I'm sending you to be the one who will lead to their redemption. Remember what Moses said? He said, I I don't know who this is. Can you tell me who is speaking to me? I I know you're God, but just tell me, what's your name? Do you remember what God, the voice in the burning bush said to Moses? In Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am who I am becomes the name of God, Yahweh the Lord, to speak about God who is, who was, and is to come. When we speak about God, we don't speak about God having a birth or a beginning. God always was. When we speak about God, we speak about God who always is. He's eternally present. And we speak about a God who always will be, who was, who is, and is to come. There is only one being in the universe who does not rely on or depend on anyone else for his existence. He's completely self-existent. And so God reveals himself that way by saying, tell them I am sent you. God's name in the Old Testament in Exodus chapter 3 is the great I am. And so it's against that backdrop that Jesus says to them, before Abraham was, I am. Look it up. Exodus chapter 3 verse 14, that's who I am. Jesus is making this claim about being one with the Father, and standing before them and saying, I am the eternal one in human flesh, standing among you at that moment. And you say, well, aren't you reading into it a little bit, Alex? I mean, is that really what the people of his day understood? Yes, it was, because notice what happens next in verse 59. At this, they picked up stones to stone him. Why? Because they understood that Jesus was making the claim to be God in the flesh. That he was appropriating the name, the old covenant name of of the great I am for himself. And in their minds, he he was elevating himself to the status of God. But in Jesus' mind, he was just simply revealing who he was. And they, they thought that Jesus was claiming to be God. He was claiming to be God. They understood him well, and they picked up stones. You say, well, why did they pick up stones? Because in the, in the Old Testament, if you blasphemed, if you misused or misrepresented the name of God, it was considered blasphemy, and it was a sin that was worthy of death. We see in John chapter 10, uh, in, John chapter 10 in another place where Jesus says, I and the Father are one. Again, another controversial statement of Jesus. And what did the Jewish leaders do? Again, his Jewish opponents picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus said to him, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? In other words, I have backed up what I've said. Why are you stoning me? And notice what they say in verse 33. We're not stoning you for any good work, they replied, but for blasphemy. Because you are a mere man, claimed to be God. They didn't believe that Jesus was God in the flesh. They said, no, you're just a mere man. You're elevating yourself, claiming to be God. Jesus saying, no, I'm not, I'm not elevating myself. I'm just revealing myself. This is who I am, right? And so this is the issue in the life of Jesus and the Jewish leaders, 
Jesus claimed to be identified with God himself, the great I am. And every statement that we'll see during the course of the summer starts with I am. And we need to remember that Jesus is making that fundamental claim that I am. So when he says, I am the true light, he's saying, I am the light from God himself that shines in this world. When he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he's saying, I am, I am God, and therefore I'm the only way. Every time he says, I am, we need to understand that Jesus is making an explicit and astonishing claim about himself. And therefore, every one of us needs to, when we hear these words of Jesus, we need to ask ourselves, do I believe it? And will I experience it in the way that Jesus intends? So I come back to the question that we started with. Who is Jesus? And I want to ask you, why does it matter today? In your sermon outline, um, I have a little chart that describes some of the different kinds of beliefs that there are about Jesus in our day. And I would say to you that who is Jesus and why does it matter? It matters, first of all, for our belief. To believe in Jesus, we must know who he is. We must know who he is and what he came to accomplish. Only as we understand Jesus in his own words, on his own terms, and come to him that way, can we truly say that we believe in Jesus For otherwise, we're believing in a Jesus of our own making. We're not believing in the Jesus revealed in Scripture. And some people in our day would say things like this. uh, Jesus never existed. There are only a few people that say that today because the evidence is overwhelming. There's, you know, 5,000 New Testament manuscripts that confirm Jesus' existence. There's extra-biblical Uh, references outside the Bible historians speak about Jesus both from Jewish and from Roman sources it's an unmistakable reality that Jesus existed so there are only a few crazies who say that Jesus never existed but there are a few some say well Jesus was a messianic manipulator Like, Jesus sort of worked everyone into a fury, and he kind of, he said things that weren't true, and he presented himself as the Messiah, but he really wasn't. He knew he wasn't, but he was trying to, you know, manipulate people. Or some say, well, the early church, Jesus died and was buried, but the early church stole the body. And then they made a whole big claim about Jesus being the risen Messiah, and and it was all a bunch of manipulation. never really happened that way, but the, the church made it up. Of course, the only problem with that is the church then believed, made up this lie and were willing to die for this lie, right? It it, it falls apart on, on the face of it, but there are some who would say that. And there are some also who would say, well, Jesus was one prophet among many. Yes, Jesus was a great teacher. He was a prophet, but there are many prophets. One of the answers that we saw on the video was from a Muslim woman who said, Isa, Jesus is one of the prophets. In fact, that's what uh, Muslims believe today. They don't, they don't doubt Jesus' existence. They simply say he was one of the prophets, but then they say Muhammad was the greater prophet. So they elevate Muhammad above Jesus, and they empty Jesus of all of his teaching and all of his redemptive value, but they still say Jesus exists. So there are different ways of approaching it, and these are some of the ways in which people in our day approach it. Uh, There are also people who say things like, Jesus was a spirit being, but not flesh. This was an idea that was very prominent in the earliest part of the church, where there would be people that would say, well, Jesus came into the world, but he was kind of like a ghost. He didn't have a real body. He wasn't really flesh. He just kind of showed up and, you know, kind of like he was spirit, but not really flesh. No, Jesus made the claim that he was fully enfleshed. He was fully human, but also fully God. There are also people today who say things like, Jesus was the first created being or an angel. This is actually the belief of the Jehovah Witnesses. With respect to my Jehovah Witnesses' neighbors, I would respectfully say to them that they have a mistaken notion about Jesus because they believe that Jesus was created. He was like a being. 
He was an angel. And, and, and so they misunderstand what Jesus says about himself. They make him one of the creations rather than the creator of all things. And that's a very common belief in our day among the cults. And there are some also who say that Jesus was God, but he's the same person as the Father. And so they say there aren't three persons in one God. There's only one God. Sometimes he appears as Father. Sometimes he appears as Jesus. Sometimes he appears as the Spirit. And I'll throw out a theological word just for you. It's called modalism, that Jesus appears in various modes. God appears in various modes. The problem with that kind of view is although it says Jesus was God, it says Jesus at one moment was, was speaking as Jesus, and then the next moment he's like, you know, sort of sending his voice into the heaven and then he's appearing as the Father. So on his baptism, when the Spirit comes down like a dove, when the voice from heaven of the Father says, this is my Son in whom I beloved, and Jesus is standing there, you have a problem. How can there be one person that, what is he, like sending his voice up to the sky? It gets a little complicated, but there are some who confuse the Trinity. They say there's you know, as a Christian, we say there are three distinct persons, but one God. And that's the claim that the Bible makes about Jesus. There's one more set of beliefs that are common in our day that I think it's important to mention. And one of those is there are many people in our day who admire Jesus. In fact, they would say something like, he's a good man. If you hear someone say, he's a good man. But he's nothing more than a mere man. There are some who say that today about Jesus. It's a very common view. Because people don't want to say anything bad about Jesus. Because there's not really, you can't really find anything bad to say about him. So you're really stretching to say something bad about him. They say, well, he's perhaps a wise philosopher, but, but certainly not the son of God. There were a few people on the video that said that. He was not the son of God. And they would say, well, Jesus differed from others in in degree, but not in kind. He was fully human, but he was like the authentic or actualized human. Um, the uh, late comedian, Steve Allen, wrote uh, some vicious um, articles against the Bible, but he never thoroughly repudiated Jesus as a person. In fact, he said in one of those articles, among human heroes, Jesus is supreme. For he not only preached, but apparently demonstrated the virtues of compassion, charity, love, courage, faith, and intelligence. Alan said of Christ, he approaches the ideal perfection more closely than anyone else who has ever lived. That might sound like a resounding affirmation of Jesus. The only problem is, is he falls way short of affirming what the Bible declares. Jesus was God in the flesh. So to acknowledge that Jesus is merely a good man, but nothing more, is to fall woefully short of what the Bible says about Jesus. He wasn't just a mere man. He was God in the flesh. C.S. Lewis, the great uh, skeptic turned believer, uh, wrote about this fallacy of thinking that we can just say nice things about Jesus, say he's a good man and move on from him. And we might be tempted to say that about Jesus, but here's what C.S. Lewis said. A man who was merely a man and said the sorts of things Jesus said wouldn't be a great moral teacher. He'd either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he's a poached egg, or else he'd be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. So when Jesus says, in John 8, 58, before Abraham was, I am, we have to conclude that either Jesus truly is speaking the truth and he truly is the pre-existent divine being now in human flesh, or else he's a lunatic or just somebody that's trying to deceive the world. But you can't say that Jesus said these things and then dismiss them and say, but I still like Jesus. You don't have that option. Jesus has to be taken at face value. Jesus is telling us today, before Abraham was, I am. And the question for each of us today is, what do I believe about Jesus? The Bible makes it clear that belief about Jesus is foundational to everything else. 
In fact, the Bible says in Colossians chapter 2, see that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world, rather than on Christ. And then Paul, in writing in the book of Colossians, says next, For in Christ all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. There is the statement of who Jesus is. All the fullness of deity in human form, in bodily form. And and in Christ you've been brought to fullness. The Bible claims that Jesus is all the fullness of deity in bodily form. And any idea or any philosophy that denies that Jesus was the eternal Son of God in human flesh falls short of what the Bible claims about Jesus. This is something that each one of us needs to understand and in our hearts come to believe and make it the central portion of our lives. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 says, But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord, as, as Almighty, as the ruler of the whole world. In your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. Let me ask you today, what do you believe about Jesus? Do you believe that He is the Lord and Savior of all history? That He's the eternal Son of God, come in human flesh to live a perfect life, to die on the cross, be raised from the dead, and is now seated at the right hand of God from whence He comes? Do you believe that about Jesus? If so, the Bible says that is the central truth of the Christian faith. And we must revere, we must set apart, we must make Christ Lord. If the eternal Son of God came to earth and did all this for us, and we just yawn at it and say, oh well, okay, time to move on, we've missed the whole point of Christianity. If Jesus is who He said He is, and I believe He is, then He demands and and we must respond to Him with the utmost seriousness and the utmost attention because if Jesus is who He said He is, everything in the world revolves around it. Everything revolves around it. Jesus made an astonishing claim about Himself that we must believe Do you believe that? Do you, with your head, do you affirm that truth? With your heart, do you trust in Jesus alone as the eternal Son of God for your salvation? With your hands and your feet, are you seeking to live out a life that glorifies Jesus as your Lord and Savior? That is the question that each one of us needs to answer today. But we must also experience it. To believe it, and experience it. And what I mean by that is we must understand how great it is and how great and good a Savior we have that He would come all the way from the eternity of heaven to take on human flesh, to live among us, to die on the cross and be raised from the dead. And the Bible declares it this way, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man. The man, Christ Jesus The man took on flesh, Christ Jesus, the Messiah, the anointed one. In that phrase, the man, Christ Jesus, we have the truth of the Bible that he is fully human, but also fully divine. That's who Jesus is. And here's why it matters for us. Jesus, as he exists today, the eternal risen, exalted Savior is seated at the right hand of God and serves as our high priest. It is this Jesus to whom you can talk to today. It's this Jesus that you can call upon and say, oh Jesus, please be here for me. I need you. Oh Jesus, save me from my sins. Oh Jesus, come help me with this situation. We can come to Jesus for He is the eternal one who exists to Bring us to the Father. Notice what Hebrews chapter 4 says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. He is the Son of God. What does the Bible say about how we should approach the Son of God? It says, Let us hold fast to our confession, for we do not have a high priest 
incapable of sympathizing with our weaknesses, but we have one who's been tempted in every way as we are yet without sin. Let us then confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and find grace for whatever need we have. What I would say to you today is if you believe with your head and your heart that the eternal Son of God took human flesh to live a perfect life for you, to die on the cross, be raised from the dead for your salvation, then that eternal Son of God continues to exist, that He is at the right hand of God, and He wants us to come to Him, boldly come to Him. He's, he exists for us to be the people that He can go to, to run to, to find shelter in, to find our salvation and our life and our help. This is the Jesus whom we serve, the one who walked in flesh and blood, who now lives and reigns forever to be with us and for us and to serve for us. So as we think over the summer about these claims of Jesus, I want us to be able to not only understand them with our head, but also to experience them with our heart. When Jesus says, I am the bread of life, we need to be able to say, Jesus, I am hungry, and only you can fill my greatest hunger. When Jesus says, I am the true light, we need to be able to say, Jesus, I'm tired of walking in the darkness and tripping and falling over myself because I can't see my way out. I need you to shine your light in my life. When Jesus said, I am the door and I am the good shepherd, we need to say, oh, Jesus, I want to be one of your sheep. I know that you came so that I can be one of your sheep. Please bring me into your sheepfold. Let me walk with you as, your shep as my shepherd. When Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life, we need to, in our, the very bones of our being, say, oh, God, I need life. I, I need life over death. I need you to be my life. When we hear Jesus say, I am the way, the truth, and the life, we need to say, Jesus, if you're going there, I'm going there. Wherever you are, I am, because you are my way. And when we hear Jesus says, I am the true vine, and apart from me, you can do nothing, but with me, you can bear fruit. We need to be able to say, oh, Jesus, I want to be able to bear fruit. I need to be connected to you as my Savior and my Lord. I want to invite you this summer to experience the great I am in a new way as we experience this great and good Savior. Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. And he invites each one of us to believe and experience that today. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that from all eternity, you and the Son and the fellowship of the Spirit existed and called into being everything that exists. You are the great creator and sustainer of life, but you also bring redemption. And so you so love the world that you sent your one and only Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. We thank you, Jesus, that when you walked the earth, you declared yourself to be the great I am, the great and good Savior. And I pray that for each person here, that they would understand the invitation that you give to us today to be the Savior of our lives and our souls and all of our eternity. May we trust in you in new ways. May we come to you and find rest in Jesus as our Savior and our Lord for we pray it in the name of the great I am, Jesus Christ, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.